بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا آمين So we've reached with the Imam in the book Umdat al-Fiqh of Imam Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi Rahimahullah and we've been going through a variety of topics pertaining to the Salah pertaining to the prayer Today we're with the Imam where he says Babu Salat al-Tatawwa the chapter or the section pertaining to the voluntary prayers and this section is very important for the following reasons um, as we'll come to know in the hadith which I'm just about to mention now Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in the hadith in Bukhari that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala said Man aada li waliyan faqad aadhantuhu bil harb Whoever shows enmity to a wali of mine a wali is somebody who's truly close to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala whoever shows enmity to a wali of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala then Allah Azawajal announces war upon that person and then the Prophet ﷺ continued and said that Allah said, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْهِ مِمَّا افْتَرَدْتُ عَلَيْهِ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَدْتُ عَلَيْهِ That my slave, my worshipper, continues to come closer to me with nothing better than that which is more beloved to me than the obligatory deeds. So the best way of getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by establishing and perfecting the obligatory, obligatory deeds. وَمَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِي يَتَّقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلْ حَتَّى أُحِبَّهُ And then my slave, my worshipper, continues to come close to me by doing the voluntary deeds, by doing the voluntary acts of worship. حَتَّى أُحِبَّهُ Until I start to love him. So after you've established the obligatory deeds, you then look to establishing the voluntary deeds. And this is why this chapter is so important, because it's going to tell us about the voluntary acts of worship that we should establish in our day-to-day -day routine or whenever we come across the opportunity to do them. And also the Prophet wasallam said, importantly in another hadith, which is collected by Imam Abu Dawood, Imam Tirmidhi and others, the Prophet wasallam said, as narrated by Abu Hurairah radiyallahu anhu, who said, سَمِعْتَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وسلم يقول, I heard the Prophet وسلم say, إِنَّ أَوْلَ مَا يُحَاسِبُ بِهِ الْعَبْدُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ مِنْ, صل... من عَمَلِهِ صَلَاتُهُ that the first thing that a person is going to be questioned about on the day of judgment from his actions or her actions are their prayers. فَإِنْ صَلَحَتْ فَقَدْ أَفْلَحَ وَأَنْجِحَ And if the prayers are correct and valid, then they will be successful. وَإِنْ فَسَدَتْ فَقَدْ خَابَ وَخَسِرَ However, if the prayers are incorrect, then they will be in a state of loss and detriment. So, فَإِنْ تَقَصَ مِنْ فَرِيدَةِ شَيْءٌ if there is something which is uh, missing from the obligatory deeds pertaining to the prayers, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his mercy, he says, قَالَ الرَّبْ عَزَّ وَجَلْ أُنْذُرُوا حَلِّ عَبْدِ مِنْ تَطَوِّئٍ فَيُكَمَّلْ بِهِ مَنْ تَقَصَ مِنَ الْفَرِيضَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his mercy will say to the angels, look to the book of deeds of my worshipper and see does he have or she have any extra voluntary deeds that can complete the defects which were found in the obligatory deeds. So every time a person does a voluntary deed, not only do they get extra reward, but if they find themselves in a situation on the Day of Judgment that their obligatory deeds are in a state of defect, then maybe Allah through His mercy will allow the person to have the defects completed and uh, overlooked by virtue of the many voluntary deeds that the person did. So that's why it's important that we study such chapters so we know what types of voluntary prayers we can do, when they are to be done, how they are to be done. And we should encourage ourselves uh, to do them, of course. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, These uh, voluntary prayers are five types. The voluntary prayers in this book of fiqh are five different types. Ahaduha asunan arrawatib. One of them, asunan arrawatiba, or arrawatib. One of these types out of the five is what is known as Sunan al ratiba As Sunan al ratiba are those Sunnah prayers which are connected to the obligatory prayers. The Sunnah prayers which come either before or after the obligatory prayers in their respective times. They are mu'akkadat, they are stressed prayers, meaning they are stressed in the sense that the Prophet ﷺ always paid attention to them whenever he could. So we as believers and followers of the Prophet ﷺ should also pay attention to them whenever we can. And from their ahkam, from their rulings, is yukrahu tarkuhu. From their rulings is that it is disliked to leave them off. And 
as pertaining to other sunnah salah, if you to leave them off, then it's not disliked. So these sunnah al-ratiba that we're going to discuss, the ones which are attached to the obligatory prayers, either before them or directly after them, these are the ones which are mu'akkada, they are highly stressed and they shouldn't be left off. If they are left off, it's makru. And all of the other sunnah prayers, if they were to be left off, then there's nothing upon the worshipper. That the, the, there's no situation which is negative regarding that. And also the sunnan ar-rawatiba, ar-rawatiba, if they are missed out due to whatever reason, and the person in, is in the habit of praying them, then the person is allowed and recommended to make them up, like also the witr prayer. So the author, he says, وَهِيَ الَّتِي قَالَ إِبْنِ عُمَرُ These ratiba prayers are the ones which the great companion Ibn Umar, may Allah have mercy upon him, said, عَشْرُ رَكَعَاتٍ حَفِظْتُهُنَّ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ Ten rakaat, ten units of prayer I memorized from the Prophet Rakatani qabla dhuhr, two units of prayer before dhuhr, not before the time of dhuhr, before the obligatory prayer of dhuhr, within the time of dhuhr. Warakatani ba'daha and two units of prayer after the obligatory prayer of dhuhr. Warakatani ba'd al maghrib and two units of prayer after the obligatory maghrib prayer. Fi baytihi. These two, the maghrib, the Prophet would pray in his house. وَرَكَعَتَانِ بَعْدَ الْإِشَاءِ فِي بَيْتِهِ And two units of prayer after Isha in the house of the Prophet وَرَكَعَتَانِ قَبْلَ الْفَجْرِ And two units of prayer before the obligatory Fajr prayer. This hadith is in Bukhari. So we see here in this hadith that the great companion Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu he said, حَفِذْتُ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. I memorized from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And it was known that Ibn Umar was one of those companions that were very keen in following everything that the Prophet ﷺ did. He was known to be one of those companions that would be very diligent in following up the actions of the Prophet ﷺ. So when he says, I memorize from the Prophet ﷺ these ten raka'at, it shows that the Prophet ﷺ would always do them whenever possible. Therefore, they are mu'akkadat, they are stressed. And that's why a person shouldn't leave them. In fact, the humbly scholars, May Allah have mercy upon them. They say that the one who is consistent in leaving off these ten raka'at in totality, then this person loses his adala. Adala is like trustworthiness, meaning that the person is not trustworthy anymore to be a witness in the Islamic courts. He loses his ability to give shahada. There is another narration, uh, which is famous, the narration of Umm Habiba, the mother of the believers, the wife of the Prophet وسلم, which is narrated by Imam Muslim. She says, سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من صلى إثنتا عشرة ركعة في يوم وليلة بني له بهن بيت في الجنة. Whoever prays, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said in this narration, twelve rakaat in the day and the night, uh, then Allah سبحانه وتعالى due to those prayers will build for him or her a house in Jannah. So the humbly scholars they say that this is not referring to the ten that we've already mentioned, rather it's referring to any twelve sunnah that the person prays. So you could pray these ten and then you could add another two or you could do any other sunnah which adds up to twelve prayers. However, the point that the Imam mentioned in the book is referring to the ten that we mentioned in detail in the hadith of Ibn Umar. Radiallahu anhu, may Allah have mercy upon him. Uh, the hadith of Ibn Umar, it continues where he says, حدثني حفسا أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كان إذا طلع الفجر وأذن المؤذن صلى ركعتين. That Hafsa radiallahu anha, she, the sister of Ibn Umar, she said that when the sun would rise in the morning, not when the sun would rise, when the time of Fajr would come about in the morning, and the Mu'addin has given the Adhan, then the Prophet وسلم, would pray two raka'a. Then the Prophet وسلم, would pray two raka'a. And this is referring to the uh, two raka'a, which is before the obligatory sunnah prayer. So this is the completion of the hadith which mentions the ten raka'at by Ibn Umar radiallahu um, The author, he says, وَهُمَ آكَدُهَا And these two are the most stressed out of these ten, meaning that they are the ones that the Prophet sallallahu never left off. Because Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, she mentioned in the hadith in Muslim, raka'at uh, al-fajr, that the Prophet sallallahu said, raka'at al-fajr khayru min dunya wa ma fiha. That these two raka'at before fajr are better than the whole world and what it contains in terms of benefit. So the person when he's in his grave or she's in her grave, 
the thing that they would wish the most is that they could come back and pray these two raka'ah due to the immense amount of reward that they have. And these two raka'ah, they don't take much time because the author, he says, It's recommended that these are prayed lightly, meaning that they are prayed quickly as long as the, uh, the arkan are done properly and the wajibat are done properly and the least amount of tranquility is there. But in general, it's recommended to pray these two quickly. The author, he said, And to pray them in the house, meaning that if a person goes to the masjid to pray, which they should do if it's a man, and they live close to a masjid, if they go to the masjid to pray, however, to pray the sunnah, these two sunnah of fajr in the house is better. Because the Prophet ﷺ would say, The Prophet ﷺ said, O oh people, pray in your houses, for verily the best of the prayer is in your houses, except for the obligatory ones, meaning that the men should pray in the masjid, the obligatory prayers. The author, he said, وَكَذَلِكَ رَكَعَةَ الْمَغْرِبِ Likewise, the two units which are prayed after the obligatory prayer of Maghrib, it's better that they pray them in the house. A side point pertaining to what we've mentioned with these uh, ten raka'at, uh, the ten which um, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu mentioned that he memorized them from the Prophet sallallahu the ten which are known as mu'akkadat, stressed prayers, sunan al-rawatib, that the traveler can pray these sunnas, the one who is traveling on a journey, can pray the sunnah or he has the uh, decision to not pray the sunnah both of them are virtuous meaning that there's nothing there's no blame upon the person in the situation of travel the person can choose to pray them or the person can choose to leave them off except for the sunnah al-fajr which is and the, and the witr prayer which is highly recommended because the prophet ﷺ never left them off the second category of these voluntary prayers that the author is teaching us is al-witr Okay, al witr The second type of the voluntary prayers is a witr And the witr is not connected to Salat al-Aisha, rather it's an independent sunnah mu'akkada, it's an independent stressed sunnah which is done after the Isha prayer and the sunnah of the Isha prayers. And it's highly stressed. The Prophet ﷺ said, as in the hadith in Tirmidhi and Abu Dawood and elsewhere, that inna Allah amaddakum bi salatin hiya khaylun lakum min humlin na'am, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted you and given you a prayer which is better for you than the red camels. And the red camels in the time of the Prophet ﷺ were valued like Rolls Royces and Ferraris, etc. are valued today. He said, Al-Witr, Allahu lakum fi ma bayna salat al-isha illa an yatla al-fajr. It is the Witr prayer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it for you between the Isha, once the Isha is done, up until the time that Fajr comes in. So this is a very virtuous prayer. And in fact, Many of the ulama, they would say that it's uh, inconceivable that a person would leave it off because the least of it is only one raka'ah. So the author, he says, ma bayn al-isha wal fajr, That the timing for it is between Isha and, for the, and until Fajr comes in. So once Isha has been prayed and the sunnah of Isha is done, then the person goes ahead and prays witr. There's a mas'ala here, there's a point here that needs to be mentioned. That if a person is doing what is known as combining the prayers, jama' taqdeem, that the person is combining the prayer of Isha in the time of Maghrib, which is allowed to be done. The person is praying Isha in the time of Maghrib. So in this situation, even though it's not Isha time, the person after praying the Maghrib and the Isha that they've joined together, they are now allowed to pray the Witr. They don't have to wait for the Isha time to come in. Because in the situation of jama' taqdeem, you have brought the, the Isha prayer to the Maghrib prayer for a valid excuse. So in this situation, you are allowed to pray the Witr straight after you've prayed the Isha in the Maghrib time. وَأَقَلُّهُ رَقْعَةً رَقْعَةً um, The author is telling us that the least of the Witr prayer is one Raka'ah. Al-Witr, the Prophet ﷺ said in the, sah- in the Hadith Sahih Muslim, Al-Witr Raka'atun min akhir layl That Witr is one unit of prayer from the last part of the night or from the night. Uh, so this is alluding, this hadith is teaching us that if you want to pray as just one, you can go ahead and pray as one unit. So it's not something which is disliked as mentioned by some scholars. You know, some scholars hold it to be disliked, but it's not something which is disliked because in fact it's authentically reported that at least 10 of the great companions of the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba, they would pray them. 
prayed like this at times one rakah. And from them is Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, etc. As mentioned in the book, Hidayat al uh, The author, he says, The most of the witr to be prayed is 11 rakah. Because Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she said in the hadith in Bukhari, مَا كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ سَلَّمْ يَزِيدُ فِي رَمَضَانِ وَلَا فِي غَيْرِهِ عَلَىٰ أَحْدَ عَشْرَ رَكَعَةً That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never used to increase whether it's in Ramadan or outside of Ramadan upon 11 raka'ah. So this is Akhthar al-Kamal. This is the best way to pray the witr if you are able to do so, to pray at 11. There are other reports that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at time would pray at 13, but the most that's narrated about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pertaining to the witr is that he used to pray at 11. And also note, that witr, the discussion about witr being 11 raka'ah, and then you have a separate discussion about taraweeh, how many raka'at taraweeh should be. These are two separate issues. Taraweeh is separate to witr. The author, he says, And the least of the best ways to pray it, the witr is to pray it three raka'ah, but with two taslims. Uh, what he means here is that you pray the witr, uh, it's recommended, highly recommended that if you pray the witr as three, you pray it two, and then you finish the prayer by making the taslim, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and then you get up to pray a third rakah independently. So you've prayed two, you finish them, and you get up to pray a third one independently. And the reason this is better than praying all three of them together, which is allowed that you can pray all three units together, and after having prayed the third, you sit down for the tashahud, and then you make the taslim. The reason praying it in the way that I've just explained is better because there's more action involved. Okay, there's more action involved, therefore there's more reward involved. Uh, it's sunnah to recite in the witr the following as in the hadith of uh, Imam Ahmad, Tirmidhi, and Ibn Majah. Uh, Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu narrates in this hadith, كَانَ نَبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَقْرَأُ فِي الْوِتْرِ بِسَبِّ حِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الْعَلَى وَقُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ وَقُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ فِي رَكَعَةٍ رَكَعَةٍ That the Prophet that Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنهما He narrated that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to pray with the surah سَبِّحْ اسْمِ رَبِّكَ الْعَلَى in the first unit of the witr and in the second he would pray with قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ and in the third it would be قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ So this is sunnah to do if you are able to do it. The author he says وَيَقْنُطُ فِي الثَالِثَةِ بَعْدَ الرُّقُوعِ and in the third rak'ah, it's highly recommended that you make the du'a al-qunut after the ruku'. It's highly recommended that you make the du'a al-qunut. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt wa afina fi man afayt wa tawallana fi man tawalayt. To the end of it, if you know the du'a al-qunut, it's highly recommended that you make it in the witr in the, after praying the third rak'ah after the ruku'. However, some ulama have said that you can do it before the ruku also. It's mustahab, either is okay, inshallah. It's something which is recommended. Tayyib. So, the author, he didn't mention an important point about the sunnan al-rawatiba, the ten sunnan that we took from the hadith of Ibn Umar and also the witr, that if you miss this, that you are allowed to make it up. You are allowed to make them up in any time as long as it's not the forbidden times. The forbidden times, inshallah, we'll take in next week's, next week's lesson. So you can make up these sunan, the ones which were sunan al-rawatiba, sunan al-rawatiba, and the witr, if you miss them, you can make them up. However, the ulama, they say that if you miss many of the 10 uh, that we mentioned in the hadith of Ibn Umar, if you miss many of those 10, then it's better to leave them and only make up the two of Fajr. You only make up the two of Fajr, which is more recommended. And you make them up in the same way that they would have pray, been prayed normally. Because Al-Qada Yahki al ada That when you make up a prayer, you do it in the same way, that, same way that you would normally do it. The third category, which the author is mentioning as voluntary prayers, he says, At-Tatawwu'u Al-Mutlaq General Unspecified uh, voluntary prayers, the prayers that are not restricted to um, the oblig not connected to the obligatory prayers. Okay, you can pray them at any time of the day as long as they are not in the forbidden times. The unrestricted nafal prayers, like for example, if somebody decides that between uh, Maghrib and Isha that they want to pray many nawafil, they want to pray nafal, then they can go ahead and do that. And in fact, it's a very virtuous deed 
many of the Salaf, many of the righteous that came before us, they used to pray between Maghrib and Isha uh, two by two by two. For example, you can pray after making wudu, you can pray two raka. This is something which is also very virtuous. Okay, you pray Tahit al Masjid two raka when you enter into the Masjid. There's many different types of sunan that you can pray throughout the day. Uh, from the most virtuous of them, also I should mention, is that the Prophet ﷺ said, Man salla al qabl al arba'a rahimallahu imrin salla qabl al asr arba'a. Or, كما قال, that the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah has mercy upon a person that prays four units of uh, prayer before the asr prayer. Meaning that the asr prayer, of prayer, the asr time has come in, but before you pray the obligatory asr, four raka'at, you pray another four raka'at before that, and you are given that huge reward of Allah having mercy upon you. And you also have the salat al-duha, which is prayed after the sun has risen, after 15 minutes after the sunrise. And many others. The author he says, that the the virtue of the voluntary prayers in the night are more virtuous than the voluntary prayers of the day. Because the Prophet said in Sahih Muslim, that the best virtuous prayer after the obligatory prayers are the prayers in the night. Why is this the case? Because the prayer in the night is when there's nobody around to witness you, everyone else is asleep and you've left your bed to go to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it shows you that you have much longing to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It shows you that you are trying to have a lot of sincerity because you're hiding your deeds from the people. You're doing the voluntary prayers when people are asleep and no one can see you. And the last half of the night or the last third of the night is better than that which is before it. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in this amazing hadith in Sahih Bukhari, يَنزِلُ رَبُّنَا تَبَارَكَ تَعَالَى كُلَّ لَيْلَةٍ إِلَى سَمَاءِ دُنْيَا هِنَا يَبْقَى ثُلُثَ اللَّيْلِ الْآخِرِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a way that befits His majesty and is known to Him alone, descends to the lowest of the heavens when it's the last third of the night, every night. Every night Allah descends to the last third, to, uh, in the last third of the night, to the lowest heavens in a way that befits his majesty and he says Man yad'uni who is there that is calling upon me that I may answer his or her supplication Man yas'aluni who is asking me a need and I will give them that need Man yastaghfiruni who is seeking forgiveness from me I will forgive them so this tremendous hadith in Bukhari encourages us that there is a special time in the last third of the night wherein Allah descends to the lowest heavens and he makes this announcement that to those people that have left alone their beds at that time half an hour before Fajr or an hour before Fajr or two hours before Fajr whatever they are able to do then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to answer their du'as and they are going to have a special relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that special time so how do you find the last third of the night? you basically divide between Maghrib and Fajr between the time of Maghrib and the time of Fajr, you divide it into three, and the last third of the night is your last third within that time frame. The author he says, Wasalatul Layli Mathna Mathna. The night prayer, the one who does the Hajjid, Qiyam al Layl, it should be done two by two. And then you end with the Witr. Because in Bukhari, narrated by Ibn Umar, the Prophet وسلم, said, Salatul Layl Mathna Mathna. The night prayer is two by two. For either Khashya Ahadukum Subh. The Prophet said the night prayer is two by two, two units, two units. And then if one of you fears that the dawn is about to come upon him, meaning that the time of Fajr, then he goes ahead and he prays one unit to make all of what he has prayed odd as a witr. Um, the author he says, وَصَلَاتُ الْقَائِدِ عَلَى النِّسْفِ مِنَ الصَّلَاتِ الْقَائِمِ that the one who prays, chooses to pray these voluntary prayers sitting down, even though they can stand, then they get half of the reward, okay? The person who chooses to pray sitting down, even though they can stand, gets half of the reward. This is only in the voluntary prayers. In the obligatory prayers, you have to stand if you are able to stand, because as we learned, that is a rukun. Standing is a rukun, and you can never leave it off unless you are unable to stand. Whereas in the voluntary prayers, you can pray sitting down if you choose to, but you will only get half of the reward. 
the time when you get the full reward, even though you are sitting in the voluntary prayers, if you are sick and unable to stand. Okay, because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Bukhari, إِذَا مَرِضَ الْعَبْدَ أَوْ سَافَرَ كُتِبَ لَهُ مَا كَانَ يَعْمَلُ مُقِيمًا سَحِيهًا That the uh, worshipper of Allah if he becomes sick uh, or, or travels, then he gets the same reward for that which he used to do whilst he was a resident or whilst he was in a good state of health. So if traveling prevents you from being able to pray or being sick prevents you from being able to pray, you still get the reward of praying as you used to do normally because that was your habit. So you were prevented from praying, therefore you still get the reward of praying in the habitual way that you used to pray. Therefore, if you pray sitting down because you cannot pray standing up due to a sickness, you're still going to get the reward of praying, the full, uh, the full reward of praying as though you were praying standing. Rabi' the fourth type category of voluntary deeds that the author is going to mention. He says, مَا تَسُنْ لَهُ الْجَمَعَةِ That which is recommended or it's sunnah to pray in congregation. وَهُوَ ثَلَاثَةُ أَنْوَعَ And it is three types. So dealing with the fourth type of the voluntary prayer, underneath it, it has three types, A, B, C. Okay, and these are the ones which are recommended to pray in jama' in congregation. أَحَدُهَا التراويح. One of them is the taraweeh prayer. Taraweeh is the prayer that is uh, given the name taraweeh from the word raha, resting. Why? Because the companions, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and the early Muslims, they would make this prayer very long. They would pray up to five hours during the night and between each four raka'ah they would take a long break. Okay, this is where the word taraweeh came from. The author says, وَهِيَ عِشْرُونَ رَكَعَةً بَعْدَ الْإِشَاءَ فِي رَمَضَانَ And this is prayed in Ramadan after Isha and it is 20 raka'at. It is 20 raka'at according to the majority of the scholars throughout the history of Islam. However, there are many scholars, there are scholars that differ over the number of what should be prayed. Should it be 13? Should it be 11? Should it be 20? Some go as far as 30 and above that. Uh, the point is that this is something which is not to be argued over. It can be discussed in an academic manner, manner but people should not argue with one another over what is the number of raka'at that should be prayed because the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't restrict the number of prayer. Rather, he said, Salatul Layl, Mathna, Mathna. The night prayer is two by two. And also, the Prophet ﷺ said very importantly in the hadith in Tirmidhi, Man qama ma'al imam hatta yansarif kutiba lahu qiyam al layl. Whoever prays with the Imam, meaning in Tarawi, until the Imam finishes, then he gets the reward of praying the whole of the night. So this is something recommended that when you find yourself in a masjid, whether they pray 11, 13, 20 or more than that, you should try to complete with the Imam because then you get the reward of praying the whole night. And in fact, Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, he said that if the people are praying raka'at, that the raka'at, they are making it long with lots of recitation, then they should pray 13 or 11. But if they are making the raka'at short, then they should increase to 20 and maybe more than that. In any case, the point I'm trying to make is that the author is mentioning 20 as is the opinion of the majority of the scholars. And sadly, you find a lot of people every year debating this issue. It should only be discussed as an academic issue. Uh, you shouldn't debate it and get upset with one another because there's a lot of scoop for, there's not scoop, there's a lot of scope for um, flexibility in this matter. Bismillah. The author, he says, and the second of, of uh, what is to be mentioned under this category of what should be prayed in congregation is Salat al-Kusuf. فَإِذَا كُسِفَتِ الشَّمْسِ أَوِ الْقَمَرِ فَزِعَ النَّاسِ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ is the eclipse prayer. So whenever the, there is an eclipse, people should rush to the prayer. Why? Because when there's a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse, this is from the signs of Allah Azawajal's majesty and greatness that He is able to change the natural order of events. He's able to cause this, this, the sun to stop benefiting the earth. He's, all, he's able to cause darkness upon the earth uh, as He wishes, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And lots of people that have superstitions pertaining to the lunar or solar eclipse, but rather the Muslims, what they do, they rush to the prayer to acknowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's majesty and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness and protection. 
إن أحبوا جماعة وإن أحبوا فرادا. That if people they want to pray the solar eclipse prayer, they can pray it whether they want to do so in group or they can pray it individually. If they pray it in a group, there is no adhan to be made for it. Rather, what is mentioned that the one who is calling the people to the prayer, he says as-salatul jami'ah, as-salatul jami'ah. Congregation prayer, congregation prayer, and the people flock to the prayer. The author, he says, فَيُكَبِّرُوا وَيَقْرَوا الْفَاتِحَ وَصُورَةً طَوِيلَةً So the imam or the person that is praying by themselves, they make the takbir and then they pray Surah Al-Fatiha and a long surah. ثُمَّ يَرْقَعُوا رَقُوءًا طَوِيلًا ثُمَّ يَرْفَعُوا Then the person, he makes a raku, a long raku, and then he gets up. Now after having got up from the raku, the person doesn't go down into the sujood. Rather, the person starts again a second raka after the raku, not going to sujood. وَيَقْرَأُ الْفَاتِحَةَ وَصُورَةً طَوِيلَةً دُونَ الَّتِي قَبْلَهَا ثُمَّ يَرْقَعُوا So then the person from the raku of the first one, he gets up and he starts a second unit. And in the second unit, he also prays Surah Al-Fatiha and a long surah, but the surah is less in length than the one that was prayed in the first unit. After that, ثُمَّ يَرْقَعُوا Then makes the raku فَيُطِيلُوا دُونَ الَّذِي قَبْلَهُ And the raku is to be less in length than the raku that was before it. ثم يرفعوا. Then the person gets up from the raku. ثم يسجد سجدتين طويلتين. And then the person makes two long sujuds. So what you're finding here is that it's one raka, okay, but it's made into two. It's one raka in the sense that after the raku, the first raku, you don't go into the sujud. Rather, you get back up and you start another surah al-fatiha with another surah. After having done that. Then you go into the raku and then you go into the sujood. And then you make two long sujood and then you get up again and you repeat what you did in the first unit. So you end up praying four raka'at in two and you have uh, four sajdas, four prostrations. So you end up praying, end up having raku four times and you end up having the sujood four times. And then you make the tashahud and you make the taslim. So this, um, this way of praying this, the lunar eclipse or the solar eclipse is the most authentic way as mentioned by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim because this is the narration that they both agree upon. There are other narrations which mention that you pray three in each standing or four in each standing but as Sheikh uh, Abd Aziz Rajihi mentioned that this is shahath, this is not uh, very firm, very well authenticated. The author, he says, الثالث, the third type of prayer which is recommended to pray in congregation, Salat al-Istisqa, the rain prayer. Salat al-Istisqa, known as Salat al-Istighatha also, the, the prayer of seeking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prayer of seeking rain. And this is done in many Muslim countries when there is a need for rain. In fact, it was done in Afghanistan recently. Afghanistan, may Allah help them, they are going through a drought and a period of uh, devastation in terms of poverty but I think it was in Khandaha recently they made the um, Salat al-Istisqa and soon after there was plentiful rain. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to this prayer if it's done with sincerity. The author he said إِذَا أَجْدَبَتِ الْأَرْضُ وَاحْتَبَسَ الْقَطَرِ This prayer is to be done when the earth becomes dry and the rain stops meaning that there's a type of a drought. خَرَجُوا مَعَ الْإِمَامِ مُتَخَشِئِينَ Then the people they go out with the Imam the Imam here means the leader of the Muslims or the one that is appointed as the leader of the Muslims. So you have uh, in the Muslim country, you have the ruler. If he doesn't come out to pray with them, then he can appoint somebody to pray on his behalf. So this person goes with the congregation of Muslims to a place outside of the masjid. It's not to pray inside the masjid, it's to be prayed outside somewhere in an open space. And they are mutakhashi'in, they are in a state of deep contemplation, a state of khushu with their eyes down, they're contemplating the situation they are in, they're contemplating who they are going to beg to relieve them from this hardship. Mutabaddilin. Mutabaddilin, it means that they leave of any form of adornment and only wear humble clothing because they're not going out in a manner to show off, they're going out to worship Allah Azawajal and to beg Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and to show to Allah Azawajal how much they are in need of Him. Mutadallilin. Mutadallilin means to com show complete poverty and humility and servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, realizing that none can remove from them their harm except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mutadarri'in means in a state of tawbah. 
because one of the best ways to relieve yourself from a difficult situation is that you make tawbah to Allah Azawajal. So the Imam, he prays with this congregation, the rain prayer, as you would pray the Salat al-Eid. Of course, we haven't covered the fiqh of Salat al-Eid, but if Allah gives us life, we can do that in the future. ثُمَّ يَخْطُبُوا بِهِمْ خُطْبَةٍ وَاحِدَةٍ Then the Imam, he will give one khutbah, not two, as in Jummah, or, or, or not two like in Eid. He gives them only the one khutbah. وَيُكْثِرُ فِيهَا مِنَ الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ And in this khutbah, lots of istighfar is made. Because the more you seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you are relieved from your difficulty. Because as the scholars said, مَا نَزَلْ بَلَا إِلَّا بِذَنْبِ no difficulty descends except due to, in most cases, due to the sins of the people. وَمَا رُفِعَ إِلَّا بِتَوْبَةِ وَالْإِسْتِغْفَارِ And it's not removed from the people except due to them repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through tawbah and istighfar. And in the Quran, in Surah Nuh, Prophet Nuh said, فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْحَارًا That Nuh alayhi salam, he was telling his people, encouraging his people that you should seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lots of istighfar, because he is the one who loves to forgive. And if you do this istighfar, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send upon you rain from the heavens. Okay, and he will send upon you uh, wealth and he will give you plentiful in your gardens etc etc lots of provisions so the istighfar it has a huge benefit if the people attach themselves to it the author he says and of course when the imam is reciting in this istisqar prayer in the rain prayer he should recite verses like the one i've just mentioned which command or re remind the believers to make istighfar and the people they take their outer garments and they turn it inside out. So, for example, the people who are wearing cloaks, they take it and they turn it inside out and they put it back on. The reason why they do this is tafa'ul. Tafa'ul meaning having hope and um, positive thought that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change the state. So, like you've changed the state of your clothing, your outer garments, Allah azza wa will change the state that the people they find themselves in. The author, he said, وَإِنْ خَرَجَ مَعْهُمْ أَهْلُ الْذِمَّةِ لَمْ يُمْنَعُوا If the people of Dhimma, the Dhimma are those Jews and Christians that live in the Islamic State or in the Islamic country and they pay what is known as the jizya, they pay the tax. And the tax is something which is tiny, less than uh, what we pay in zakah. And it's, uh, so we, the Muslims pay more in zakah than the non-Muslims pay in the jizya. So these people that live with the Muslims in peace and security uh, and pay this tax, they are known as Ahlul Dhimma. So if the Ahlul Dhimma, they want to go out and they want to make in their own way a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are not prevented from doing so. Why? Because it's the right of every human being and every creature on this earth to be provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, umiru an yanfaridu anil muslimin. However, they are asked and commanded to be away from the Muslims because Kufr, disbelief, is that which angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to have those with you when you are making dua to Allah azawajal, in you are begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change your state, you are begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive the Muslims for their sins, then you don't want to have those people who have the greatest sin, which is the sin of disbelief, with you. So they are asked and they are commanded to go ahead and do whatever they want to do, but away from what the Muslims are doing uh, in their prayer, because kufr, Disbelief is that which angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Adarb al khamis and this is what we'll finish with inshallah, the fifth type of the voluntary prayers is sujood tilawa Sujood tilawa is the prostration that you do at times when you are reading certain verses in the Qur'an. Uh, they are known that at, at certain points in the Qur'an you will make a prostration uh, when you come across these Sajdat Tilawa, Sajdat Tilawa. Excuse me. In Bukhari, Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu, he said, Qaratu ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wal najm, falam yasjud fiha, wal najmi, falam yasjud fiha. That uh, Zayd ibn Thabit was reading this uh, surah, which has in it Sajdat Tilawa, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at this time didn't make the sajda, he didn't make the prostration. So this hadith shows us 
that is not obligatory to make this prostration, rather it's something which is recommended. Okay. However, the Imam's opinion is, as is the opinion of the Hanbali scholars and the majority of ulama, that this sajda tilawa is to be treated like you would treat a normal prayer, in the sense that you have to have wudu for it, in the sense that you have to face the qibla, and in the sense that you have to make the taslim. <coughs> so the author, he says, وَهُوَ أَرْبَعَ عَشْرَةَ sajda. This sajda that you would make, the prostration of recitation, is found in 14 different places in the Qur'an. فِي الْحَجِّ مِنْهَا إثنتان. In Surah Al-Hajj, you find it having two, two places in that Surah, Surah Al-Hajj, of prostration. Al-A'raf, you will find one. Wal-Ra'd, Wal-Nahl, Wal-Isra, Wal-Maryam, Wal-Hajj, Ithnatan, Wal-Fulqan, Wal-Naml, Wal-Alif, Lamim, Sajda, Wal-Fusilat, Wal-Najm, Wal-Inshiqaq, Wal-Alaq. All of these Surahs, uh, you will find in the Qur'an that you can do uh, the Sajda Tilawa, the prostration of recitation, if you wish to do so. It's recommended for the one who is reciting to do this prostration, also for the one who is intentively listening, not the one who just happens to be listening. So the mustami' the tali is the one that is reciting, the mustami' the one who is intentively, who intends to listen, and the sami' is the one who happens to listen. So it's not obligatory on a person or it's not uh, upon a person to make this prostration if they're just walking past and they hear the Qur'an. So they're walking down the street, they hear the Qur'an coming from a car, they don't have to prostrate in the street. It's, it's more referring to the one who is sitting somewhere with their, listening to the Qur'an intensively, attentively and they come across a, um, a, prostration, uh, a, uh, a prostration of recitation such that tilawa, then they should do this uh, prostration. The author, he explains how to do it. He says, وَيُكَبِّرُ إِذَا سَجَدَ وَإِذَا رَفَعَ ثُمَّ يُسَلِّمُ The person, he makes the takbir before going into the suj, sujood, and he makes the takbir from uh, getting up from the sujood also because it's treated like a prayer. Tayyib, uh, inshallah, we'll stop here, inshallah. That's all I want to say pertaining to these points today, inshallah. And the next session is going to be a very important one.